Thank you, and good afternoon. The only correction I would make on the introduction is I don't think about myself as an expert. I think about myself as an educator and a learner, and now really around learning to improve how our large, complex institutions and the very complex work that our faculty do within those institutions, how we can get better at getting better. To set the context for this work, and the work we've been engaged in at Carnegie now for almost six years, we live in truly extraordinary times. We're now asking much more of our educational institutions than ever before. We want much more ambitious academic outcomes for many more students. Put quite simply, we need to be more effective. We live in a time when the press on the public purse has been quite restrictive for some time and is likely to be going forward. And therefore, we're also called to make our educational institutions more efficient, to use the resources we have more wisely. And we have far too many of our students who continue to walk out of our classrooms and our institutions without completing their degrees, their programs. And so we have a problem of student engagement as well. To make serious headway on any one of these three problems would be an extraordinary undertaking. But today, we now have to move simultaneously on all three. These are extraordinary times. In the absence of learning how to get better at getting better, we confront this growing chasm between our aspirations for what we want our educational institutions to accomplish and what we are actually able to achieve routinely day in and day out. So how in the past have we gone about trying to solve our problems? Because we have certainly not been standing still. It's a phenomenon that has what I can describe as kind of an environmental entropy to it and which we've coined a phrase for this. We call it solutionitis. Whenever, whenever a problem suddenly gets some social salience and we suddenly direct a lot of attention to it, this cacophony of activity begins to emerge. In the work that we've been doing, it's focused on student success, particularly in community colleges, and especially focused on the gatekeeper function that developmental math plays in community colleges. As we began to do our work in this area, we saw this incredible array of responses to this problem. Well, some people will say it's a textbook problem. The mat materials just aren't relevant. So we should really embrace the open source materials movement, and that's the solution. Well, and others will say, no, it's really a student motivation problem. And we should really focus on learning communities, and we should focus on interventions that change student mindsets. And others will say, well, we're really not aligning students' academic and career goals, and therefore we really have to design more meaningful courses of study. And still others will say, it's a human resource problem. You know, we really have to work on professional development and faculty inquiry groups and, and getting faculty better at what they do. And then finally, others will say, well, really, it's an institutional leadership issue. And we need to incent leader, we need to have new leader development programs, and we need to incent institutions to operate in very different ways. And I could go on and on. I think you get the flavor of this incredible array of activity that gets spawned as a problem begins to emerge and really attract our attention. This phenomena, in some senses, resembles, reminds me of the problem, biblical account of the Tower of Babel. We have a lot of people who are very good, who are working very hard, who are trying to accomplish something very complex together. But without some common language, without some systematic ways of working to get from that ground to that target, we just can't build the kind of complex products the kind of solutions we need to the problems we now confront. Because each of us working alone at best sees only a part of the problem, and we lack the integrative capacities as a field to advance real progress on the complex work in which we're all engaged now. So the problem that we now confront 
is this one of we're actually operating in very complex systems. And the work that faculty do are increasingly complex. The work that educational leaders are called to is increasingly complex. The institutions in which you work have grown in complexity over the last several decades. One of the, one of the key observations that comes out of complexity theory is that when you try to improve work in such environments, no matter how good the policy thinking is, no matter how good the strategic planning is, we cannot circumvent the fundamental character of systems problems. The only way we can really address them productively is to learn our way into solutions. So to put somewhat differently, if we continue to do what we've always done, we will continue to get what we've always gotten. So we need a better way. And this better way that we've been engaged in really integrates two big ideas. The discipline that derives out of something that's now referred to as improvement science. And when this work is carried out in structured networks, we're actually able to accelerate how we learn to improve. The goal of this work is learning faster together in order to achieve quality outcomes reliably at scale. And every part of that sentence is really significant. Learning faster, together, achieve quality outcomes reliably at scale. How do we do this? Well, part of our inspiration comes from this work in improvement science, which of course began in industrial quality improvement some 60 years ago. And then a couple of decades ago, a small group, about a half a dozen doctors, went to study industrial processes on the job floor at Japan. Now, can you imagine this conversation of a group of doctors looking at how Toyota was getting better at what they do and, and coming out of that believing that there's something we can learn from this that could actually help our large, complex healthcare institutions get better at what they do? Well, I would argue if the doctors can learn from studying industrial quality improvement on the job floor at Toyota, we could learn something from them. And so we've become deep students of the quality improvement movement in healthcare and, and have brought what is now being referred to as the science of improvement from it into, into the work we're now engaged in in education. And then we've joined to this the power of structured networks, which is another big observation it's emerged in the last decade or so, where we've begun to really appreciate how when individuals are working together in structured networks, problems that seemed in the past unsolvable can now be actually addressed. This has become a centerpiece of the work in modern science, all across the physical and biological sciences, and it has inspired a new ethic, one that, along this line, we can accomplish more together than even the best of us can accomplish alone. Well, how do these structured networks actually accelerate learning to improve? Well, education is the quintessential large network. There are literally hundreds of thousands of people doing closely related work every day. They're constantly trying new things in their classrooms and they're in their, in their institutions. So that means virtually any question that I might ask or I might think about or problem I'm trying to engage, somebody somewhere out there, probably in this audience, has already thought about this and has actually maybe made some headway on this problem. I just don't know who you are or where you're located or what specifically you've learned. This is what structured networks seek to accomplish because we now know that very large networks are these powerful sources of innovation, because if a lot of people are working on a related problem, somebody somewhere is going to figure something good out. And if we connect these individuals together, we can really accelerate the testing and diffusion of promising practices and build an evidence base about what works for whom under what set of circumstances. Other thing that happens in large networks, if we're, especially if we're sharing common data and working on trying to solve a common problem, 
is that you can begin to see patterns across a network that no one individual or no one institution may be actually able to discern because you simply need more data to be able to see it. And I'll give you an example of that a little later in my talk. And then the final thing that happens when these networks are really structured as learning environments, they engage a different kind of conversation among participants. When we know that comparative data is a very powerful source for improvement, but it can also engender a kind of conversation where when people first get these, get information about their own work, there's a tendency to want to discount the data. There's something wrong with the surveys. There's something wrong with the, with the analysis that's been done. Or, well, what other people have gotten doesn't really apply to us because they have different students or different circumstances. We try to find a way to make the data go away. In these network communities that we've been building, it's a very different kind of exchange because we're working on the same problem. We're working within what's called a common driver diagram a working theory about how we're actually going to make improvement together. So if I'm looking at your results and you're looking at mine and, and suddenly I realize you're getting really better outcomes than I'm getting, the natural question is, well, what are you doing? How did you do that? That's the learning exchange that we want to try to get accomplish in these improvement networks. And they also create a little kind of moral impetus to them because if we know that others are now achieving on problems that we thought were insurmountable, it leads to the natural question, well, if others can do this, why can't we do this too? So structuring these networks to support this kind of learning to improve is another, is that second powerful engine in getting better. All right, put some context on this, the kinds of problems we need to solve and the work that we've been engaged in at Carnegie where we're both trying to solve a very important educational problem, and in the course of doing that, we're trying to learn how to bring this discipline of improvement research, continuous improvement, quality improvement, it goes by different names, how to bring this kind of discipline into the way in which we go about solving educational problems. Right, so what's the problem we've been working on? As I mentioned before, it's the issue around the very high failure rates in developmental mathematics instruction in community colleges, although this is also a common problem in many four-year institutions as well. In the typical community college, upwards of 60 to 70 percent of the students who come to the community college doorsteps are assigned to developmental math. Upwards of 80 percent of those students will never, will never acquire college-level math credits. And we send 500,000 students every year down this pathway. 500,000 students every year. There must be a better way. Well, here's what we now know. Working now in a network of over 50 community colleges, we've established baseline data on what normally happens in these colleges. When following a traditional developmental math pathway, some 6% of students acquire college math credit in one year. Some 15% of students acquire it in two years. We've now demonstrated that over 50% of students can acquire college math credit in a single year. So to put simply, across these 50 colleges, we've seen that it's possible to triple the success rate in half the time. Well, how do you do this? This is about the systematic work of quality improvement. The first part of this work is really trying to understand the problem. Why is it that we continue to get the results we've always gotten? Well, and this is a very complex mix of inquiry. We're looking at the best of what we know from empirical research. We're engaging educational professionals at all levels, teachers, department heads, institutional leaders, stitching together a coherent account of what are the primary factors that keep us from much better success rates. Well, first one we found out is it actually turns out in that traditional pathway that we lose more students between the courses than who fail within them. So that immediately suggests 
Let's think about consolidating this as a pathway. If you register in September, you're in a cohort that's been put together to achieve a valued objective within the course of a year. There are issues about material and instruction being not engaging. We also know that there are literacy and language barriers where the students can learn the mathematics, but the materials, the assessments, sometimes the discourse in the classroom really is part of the problem. Also, many of the students who are assigned to developmental math have come to think about themselves as not good at math. Uh, they've come to see that they've come to think about this as not interesting, relevant in their lives, and so we have to address these mindset issues. And then we have a data problem. We know that students will tend to disengage. It's going to happen within the first two or three weeks, but typically institutions don't have data on that disengagement until after they're gone. They've withdrawn or they failed at the end of the first semester. So we need better information sooner so we can identify students who are at risk and be able to target interventions to them. And then finally, there are issues about faculty practices and beliefs and convincing them that if we teach new material and we teach it in different ways, that these students can, in fact, actually achieve. So what are then, with that kind of analysis, that then leads to what we call the drivers for success. Changing the learning goals, rather than putting students into remedial math before you get to something new, organize instruction around college level content and embed the remedial support under it. Use the best of what we know from learning sciences, from comparative studies of mathematics instruction across countries as to how to organize the kind of tasks that students engage in and the kind of much more engaging pedagogy inside of the classrooms, what might be called research-based practices. Use the best of what we know from social psychology about how to affect students' mindsets about mathematics, how to make them feel like they belong in an environment which historically has treated them as if they did not belong, and to convince them that there is actually purpose and value in the work they're doing, what we call productive persistence. We have another strand that works directly on the issues of language and literacy barriers. And then the fourth big one is about advancing quality teaching because if we're going to ask faculty to teach new content in different ways to students who have historically not succeeded, this is an important, it's very important that we support them to actually achieve that. And then organized behind around all of this and driving the improvement work is this focus on continuous improvement fueled by good data about what is actually happening and not happening. So across this this network of 50 community colleges, there are common end of course assessments that are used. There's common data that's collected on the first day of instruction about students' background and how they, and how they think about work in mathematics and so on. So we've got common frameworks, we've got common data, we're sharing information so that we can learn from each other about how to get better at helping these students achieve. So what does this social learning system to improve actually look like? Well, it's actually got, it's like a three-legged stool. In some cases, it involves translational research, where we know some things from more basic social science that we can bring into the classroom. It involves learning by constantly examining data across the network. And it involves actual work by individual faculty and in what may, might be called the scholarship of teaching and learning, how to actually get better things to happen at the most basic work level in classrooms. So translational research. Here's an example of the work that we've done. It turns out that there's some very fine research in social psychology about this transition between fixed mindsets and, and growth mindsets in mathematics. Many students carry around this idea that uh, some people are good at math and others are not. Many faculty carry around this idea that some people are good at math and others are not. In fact, we know from very well done experimental studies that it's actually possible to change an individual's mindset from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset. That with effort, you can learn to achieve this. And so part of this is could we take then what's been found in social psychology and could we translate it into a workable intervention that could be done in the first day of classes in these, um, in these various pathways. And so 
The original work was done with four-year students, actually four-year students in rather selective institutions. So the, the text that students read as part of this activity had to be shortened, and some of the language had to be addressed. There are some mechanics about how to actually get this work in a community college classroom. And first and foremost was what we might call the smell test. If somebody tried it, would the students actually do it? Would the faculty think like it's a worthwhile activity? Because if we fail on that account, there's no point in trying to run this out at a very large scale. So starting very small, doing this in one classroom, eventually trying it in one college, and then within four months, introducing this to the whole network because we'd already begun through these small rapid cycles of change to develop some evidence, develop some evidence that this actually does work in community college classrooms. And we had some faculty who were part of this network who had actually been doing this who could now advocate this work to their colleagues. So it wasn't just some academics, some researchers coming up here and saying, this is what we think you should do. This was faculty talking to faculty about how to improve their work. So that's the translational work. The learning from network data. And this is, give you two quick examples of this. One of the major uh, foci for this improvement work is around what we call starting strong. Because again, as I mentioned earlier, we know we tend to lose students very early in the first two to three weeks. And we, know that we also know more generally from social change theory that it's very important for individuals to experience success early on in what may be a complex and difficult journey ahead. So we put a lot of attention into what we do the first two to three weeks. Well, how do we know whether these changes are actually an improvement? We have this basic, sh this short survey, two minutes, that we ask of students on the first day of class and then we ask it again four weeks later. Across the network, what we've seen is that interest in math goes up in those first four weeks. Their belief that intelligence is fixed declines. That means we have many more students moving toward a growth mindset. Their anxiety about math is down, and their uncertainty about belonging in this classroom is also down. So we've got some evidence looking across this that we think we're onto something. This focus on starting strong really matters. But then we dig deeper, because on average, this says on average, we seem like we're heading in the right direction. But is this actually working for all of our students? Well, that gets us to the second use of network data, identifying opportunities for further improvement. And we have, as I mentioned before, this very short survey. It's about 24 questions that we ask on the first day. And one question in particular turns out to be extremely, how students respond to this question, turns out to be highly predictive of whether or not you're still going to be there at the end of the first semester. And it's how students answer this question. How often, if ever, do you wonder, maybe I don't belong here? It's a direct question about the social psychology of belonging uncertainty. This is a very general phenomenon, by the way, belonging uncertainty. We all experience it when we move into a new context, a place that's different. We have doubts about whether we actually belong there. Students in community colleges are subject to this. And especially in this case here, we see this as an especially strong phenomenon for African-American students, because this belonging uncertainty actually interacts with what's been referred to as stereotype threat. That there's this, this assumption that some, some students don't belong here and they're not likely to succeed. So that says, despite the fact that we're actually making progress, we've now identified some places where further attention is needed. The last piece, the last strand of this social learning to improve is around the actual direct work of faculty on what might be called actually micro routines of practice in their classroom. A group of faculty came together, and they were worried about student attendance, because student attendance is obviously a key predictor of whether or not you're likely to succeed in the classroom. And one of the faculty members started collecting weekly attendance on her Statway classroom. And you notice it was going along pretty well at about 90% or so. And then there's this sudden precipitous drop. And you know what that drop is? 
It's the day after the midterm exam. Suddenly, attendance is down. And this faculty member had seen this on several occasions in the past. So there was a change idea, something called a group noticing routine. Because the organization of instruction and the pathways, students are working in groups. So everybody is responsible for noticing who's present each day in their group. And if they're not, send them a little email saying to them, I missed you today. I hope you'll be back tomorrow. If you need any help catching up, let me know. What has been seen in the past, instead, what was seen in this one classroom is this real bump back up in attendance that persisted throughout the remainder of the semester. And now a group of faculty are trying this in the network, are trying the same routine. So it worked in one place. Can we get it to work in a smaller number of places? If it works there, can you then get it to work in an increasingly large number of places? This is the work of systematically learning to improve. So how does a network improvement community operate then? It has an explicit problem to solve with measurable aims, getting from that 5 to 50% success rate. It works like a scientific community. It's got a working theory about how improvement's going to come about. It's got some common data that people are looking at. There's this focus on variability and performance. And there's this disciplined inquiry organized around these three improvement questions. What specific change do I want to introduce? How will I know, and how will I know whether or not the specific change will actually be an improvement? And finally, there's this commitment to document and sharing what you did, what you learned, and what you might try next. Uh, I know I'm running short on time. I'm going to then close a little bit earlier. But what I want to share with you to close today is, some, is a little bit of dialogue from some of the faculty who've actually been involved in doing this work in our community college network. All right, so let me just get this up. It's about two minutes. One thing I feel about teaching is that so much of it is done in isolation. Um, lawyers practice together, doctors practice together. We go to our classrooms by ourselves and we practice alone. And so being part of the NIC for me has been, uh, has been wonderful, uh, just interacting with other teachers, both in my own college and um, across the country that are working on this project. What's been so valuable about my work within the network has been the close contact with really the experts in the field of teaching and research in how people learn. Um, it's, it's really been, that's been so valuable for me and something that I've been able to share with others. My favorite word is community because teaching isn't always in a community. Um, as Kristen said, you go, to, you go to work, you go to class, you teach and you leave and there's not a big sense of community and Carnegie's uh, Nick's provide a community for the sharing of information and the uh, development of new ideas, which is not something that you do in your job on a day-to-day -day basis. Working with a student and you think there need to be some change the next time you teach it, you kind of do it on your own. It's kind of like a silo effect, but now that we have this network involved, we bounce off the ideas with other people and they say, yeah, what you tried didn't seem to make much sense. Maybe you need to try this. It's just a different way of looking at improving what you're doing. You're not improving in isolation. You're improving with uh, the cooperation of other, of other colleagues. I think that's really important. It's just really awe-inspiring, and it's very inspiring to me as a faculty member that, that there are other people out there who are, are putting so much energy and so much you know, intellectual power into helping us do what we're doing and helping us help students. So as I close, the last I would leave with you is kind of an exhortation to embrace and, and if this makes sense to you, share today's message that if we continue to pursue change as we have, it means slow progress. And we simply have to learn how to improve faster. Improvement research, idea of continuous quality improvement carried out through network communities offers us a better way. And I invite you to join with us in this journey around learning to improve. Thank you.
All right. I guess I'll stand here then. I think I was supposed to have a chair up here, but. Yeah. Have we got it? All right. Ah, there it is. I see it. <laughs> I'd like to thank the uh, full service moderator. And um, I'm proud to ask with Inside Higher Ed. Know many of you. I'm a Rochester, New York native, so I'm always happy uh, when Nancy invites me to be with SUNY folks. So it's great to be here. And um, in thinking about what I wanted to ask all of you, uh, and from having heard the sessions today, at one, in some sense, no one could disagree that leadership is important, that change is needed, that reforms of remedial education are needed, and yet, as a cynical journalist, um, I can't help but think, while we're doing this, I'll be getting an email from somewhere, not in SUNY, of course, um, <laughs> from somebody telling me about the next no confidence vote, that there are a lot of people who feel that change and leadership in higher education right now doesn't involve everybody, it's not, sometimes it's faculty versus administrators. Sometimes faculty and administrators are on the same side and the governor's trying to run the president out of town. Um, you've got a lot of dissension. And so I'm wondering, having heard all this talk about leadership, uh, much of it, what we've heard, you know, really inspiring stuff about military leadership, about business leadership, is higher ed leadership the same? Uh, how different is it to lead a campus from some of the leadership that we've heard about before? And so I'll start, actually, so in addition to Tony, who just spoke, we have Harvey Stanger from SUNY Binghamton, and we have Ellen Hazelcorn from the Irish Higher Education Authority. But Harvey, let me start with you. Um, as you've been listening to the discussion here, how do you see leadership and change at, in higher education generally and at a place like Binghamton? Yeah. Um, Thank you, Scott. Uh, I've been listening to a lot of the talks today, and, and you're right, we, we probably haven't gotten focused in on higher education yet, and maybe I can spend a little bit of time. So the, the history of continuous improvement and, and how it affects the organizations has is, is probably been around since the 80s. Uh, Malcolm Baldrige Award, Motorola started. Actually, in the, in the mid-80s, uh, Motorola teamed with Northwestern and then challenged other universities to work with, with corporations to, to learn about total quality improvement. Um, the institution I was at partnered with Alcoa, and we came back from that conference, and, and we realized, you know, there's a big difference between organizations, uh, and that something that might work in an industrial manufacturing facility is definitely not going to work in a university. Uh, it felt that way, and we tried it a few years, and we found out, you know, some of these things don't work, and you try to put the reasons behind why they don't work. It's not just fear that, it, well, we're, we're smarter than that. We can figure this out on our own. The time scales are much different. Uh, you, you make a change in university that might want to improve your six-year graduation rate. You're going to learn about it in six years. Uh, and you might have a change of leadership in many locations within the university between the time you start that pro project and the time you end. So the time scale is different. Uh, the, the labor force is much different. I mean, our labor force uh, is, is all PhDs on the academic side as opposed to a manufacturing uh, labor force. Uh, the scale or the, the type of goals that we're trying to achieve are so much different. Um, universities are trying to impact society. Companies are really trying to impact the bottom line. And, and so they have a much easier time of measuring what is improvement. And we have a hard time just agreeing on what we're going to measure. Uh, we may measure 100 different things, and each one has their own special interest group that wants to have that measured, uh, we have to then figure out how do we measure societal impact in a way that our faculty can say, yeah, I agree with that, and therefore I will help make the change necessary in the future. And uh, uh, buy-in is critical. Uh, inclusiveness is, inc is critical. Transparency is critical. Uh, giving them a crazy 
uh, start of the process sometimes is helpful because they like really crazy beginnings because they're, 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 uh, uh, they're very ambitious. And, and so at Binghamton, I, I came in and I read something in a newspaper or, or some magazine that said Binghamton University was the premier public university of the Northeast. And I said, well, this is cool. Um, and I went into a faculty meeting. I said, hey, we've won the regionals. Let's win the nationals. Let, let's be the premier public university in the 21st century. And they just, they just laughed. I mean, they were almost leaving the room. And I said, wait, wait, wait. We get to define premier. We get to sit around for the next six months, eight months, however long it takes, and define what is premier from our perspective. Then they bought in. Now they were able to set what is the future going to be like for higher education. They loved that, at least I think they loved the conversation. There's a faculty member here who can tell me whether or not they did. And at the end of that, they said, yeah, now we know what premier means, and we're willing to measure it. But before I get the others involved, I want to ask you a follow-up question. I hear from many faculty members at so-called premier universities that we're, society is too focused on change. And, the, and many would look at a place like Binghamton and say, you've got a great student body. It's hard to get in. You have great faculty who are known for teaching and research. You are in New York State. What more could you want? Shouldn't you be just preserving that rather than saying, we need a new model? Right, right. And, and so you, you have to set some um, measurable goal that you can say, this is going to help us become premier. And, and so we set an enrollment goal and a faculty size goal. Uh, we wanted to grow by 2,000 students, and we wanted to grow by 150 net faculty, which is about a 13 to 1 student to faculty ratio. And, and the faculty bought into that. They certainly accepted that. Um, so you give them something that is, you can see in three or four years or one or two admission cycles. But then it's not just about getting bigger. It's about getting better. So you have to say, what is it that we're doing to help you become more successful, be a better teacher, be a better researcher? Uh, be a better advisor. Um, and so you, we, we kind of put together a, a, a competition almost for resources. You, critical. You need some resources to move the dial on this. You, it's very hard to move it without something that you can reward good ideas with, uh, even if it's only a couple percent of your budget. And so you put that out there. You, you look for ideas. You try to create ideas. And then the ideas you bring out is saying, these are the ways we can make you more successful. We can create a new center for learning and teaching. We can improve faculty startup. We can increase the number of PhD stipends that we have. Uh, uh, we can do things that will help you do better at your job, knowing that if they do better at their job, all these macro level things will change uh, almost as a, a primary factor driving a secondary factor. So, so Ellen, give us a perspective from Ireland. How does leadership in higher education and promoting change look there? What, what are the big issues there, and how are leaders uh, succeeding or not at promoting change? Well, um, I found a lot of the discussion here is really quite similar and, and quite different. Um, I th I'd say I'd start at the, at the point of saying we've been through quite um, a huge economic crisis, not dissimilar to a lot of things that have happened in this country in the individual states, and that itself has been an enormous driver. And I expect I would also start by saying that we in higher education, we talk a lot about change, but I also wouldn't beat us up a lot. I've been a vice president for 20 years. I'm now working as policy advice. But you notice change when you look backwards. And I think we beat ourselves up a lot. Higher education is both has made enormous changes in the way it's gone about its business. And we have, and this isn't trying to be an apology about it, but it is to say that there have been lots of changes made. Lots to do, but we have done lots of things. And in the Irish sense, I would say that we faced um, a 30, 35% reduction in budgets. We've had an 11% um, increase in students and a 10% reduction in in staff. And at the same time, I would um, challenge, um, and unless money that we get in terms of uh, GDP percentage than the US with far better outcomes, 80% at least completion rates within the expected four or three year cycle. It could be a three year um, honors degree or, or a four year degree. 
Um, so 80% completion. We've got over 50% participation in higher education, one of the highest the returns in terms of, um, of um, wage premium for people is the highest in the OECD. So we're doing something right, and yet our resources are going down. So the institutions are responding extraordinarily well in extremely difficult circumstances. Having said that, we've got a lot of the same. We've got many of the same issues, but not to the same degree. And institutional leadership comes, it seems to me, from the leaders themselves, but also at the system level. So many of the kinds of things we're trying to do are not dissimilar from what SUNY is trying to do, is to look at the system, how it is that we can work together. And so my variation on your comment earlier was is maximizing um, capacity beyond individual capability. Right. And so I look at that in terms of what the system can deliver and where that's important in the European context and outside the US is that we're not chasing rankings at a system level. Um, whatever about the individual institutions, that's their business, but we're not, and they're not being funded for it. And that's a big issue from a national point of view compared to what other governments are doing. So these are raise other kinds of issues. So Tony, so building on that and what, what Harvey said about that resources are necessary. So I have heard great things about the remedial math program that you described. Um, but you provided key support, key professional mm -hmm. development yep. for that. Could every SUNY community college replicate that? Or do they need you to write them a check first? And, and I think they're all willing to wait in line Car after. Carnegie Foundation um, for the Advancement no, of Teaching, just... Stanford, uh, <laughs> California. Uh, the, um, well, whenever you're doing improvement work, you can't improve everything all at once. So you have to target what you think are the, what we would call the high leverage problems. For example, when we started, we started with this idea that we really wanted to work on improving success rates through community colleges. Well, that's a big complicated problem and a lot of it's in instruction, but a lot of it's in financial aid, a lot of it's in the complicated work lives and family lives of students. Uh, if you kind of drill down and look at, well, where are the real impediments? Where are the things you can actually make a difference on? That's what got us to focus on developmental math in community colleges. So there is strategy involved in this, identifying critical places where you think you really can improve, and doing that in networks. So it's not, I mean, one of the strong parts of this message is it's not an individual faculty who's gonna, member is going to solve this. It's not an individual institution, but you're a great state. I mean, working in networks around common problems, you can accomplish, I think, meaningful improvements. And yes, it will take some resources to do this. I, I do want to come back to Harvey's comments earlier about, uh, about this movement of improving science and education. Because whenever you go and look at another field, and we think about ourselves as kind of analogical scavengers. I'm constantly looking for other sectors that seem to have made headway on a problem we've got that we can learn from. And healthcare was a very important place to go to look because if you look at the early history of quality improvement moving into healthcare, which was about 20 plus years ago, I can point you to conversations about this work where they're talking about doctors and patients and how this stuff just won't work in healthcare. And if you took out the word doctors and patients and you put in the, and you put in the word teachers and students, you'd swear this was an educational conversation. So I, I think it's a little too simplistic, quite honestly, to say that we can't learn from others how to get better at doing our work. And, uh, and this same movement, you know, over 25 years has transformed a whole, a whole a whole field in healthcare, and we can do some of that in education as well, because the evidence is really clear about where we're succeeding and where we're not. And part, you know, I've come out of the K-12 world, so I've seen what policy has done in K-12, and I have seen what, and it goes back to my argument about when you're really trying to improve complex systems now no matter how smart the people are who are deriving policy, uh, no matter how good the strategic plan, 
you're not going to get it right through that strategy. And we've seen what that has done in K-12, and it's coming in post-secondary. And what I've said over and over as I engage faculty is that, well, you're at a fork in the road. You've got two choices. You can own the problems that exist inside your institutions and say, we're going to work in really systematic ways to address them. Or you can wait till somebody else does it to you. And I can tell you, I know which one is better. But, but to, just to follow on that, um, many faculty pride themselves on a sense of autonomy. Yes. They may be all teaching Econ 101 or Bio 101, but they love the idea that they should pick the textbook that they prefer, the teaching methods they prefer, um, the grading system that they prefer, and so forth. When you talk about you know, identifying best practice and everyone should embrace it, are you talking about a fundamental change in that faculty autonomy in the classroom? It's the exact, that was exactly the same dialogue with doctors. My surgical theater. Nobody tells me in my surgical theater about how to do this practice. But we know that unconscionable levels of harm and disability can come about in that same surgical theater. We know there are ways in which things can be done better. So if what we, what, what we would say is, what, what they say in quality improvement, is that if you can show me that this is, you've, you've got real effectiveness occurring, do it. But we know, when we know some things that work, you can't say, I'm not going to use that because uh, I just don't like doing it that way. We need, to, we need to have a more evidence-based conversation about what works for whom and under what set of circumstances. And it's evidence about efficacy that has to eventually drive our practice. And that's the kind of conversation that has to be begun, that we can't keep teaching the way we've always taught because, well, that's the way I do it. That explanation just can't be good enough anymore. Can I disagree with Tony? Please. Okay. Yeah. Um, and maybe the, the, the stereotype of the faculty member who doesn't listen or doesn't work in teams, I, I, that's wrong. I mean, the faculty today are concerned about these problems. They are working in teams. They are developing new strategies to, to improve, whether it's retention or performance. Um, hospitals are different than universities. Hospitals are much more like a factory than a university. Hospitals, the goal is to get that patient out the door. And the time scale, again, time scale is critical in, 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 is in, in um, continuous improvement for measurements. The time scale is days, weeks. Um, university time scales are still decades sometimes, but definitely on, on the scale of years. And when you look at a process within a hospital, it is a process. It does follow standard processes Teach, over, over scale. Teaching is a process. And, and that the, it, so right, so the teaching part is a process, yeah. which is one step within it. I think the, the total system analysis is, is um, a far way away from trying to find out if I can get high school students through their first math class. To try to improve the entire system while the theory is correct is very difficult. And I think we've struggled with that uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, continuous improvement may work well in, in education within a certain set of, of types of problems to solve. But when you look at a much more complex system, it, it is much more difficult. And then I think it starts to take more of a, a role of leadership, uh, more heuristics. Um, you, you have to travel along parts of the road uh, blindly at times, looking for help okay. from your colleagues. Um, but but this, the, the continuous improvement science, I, I think we have to be careful about adopting that and, and going back and saying, hey, faculty, we got to do this this TQM stuff because it's going to make us the premier. There's, there's a difference. I just want to say there's a difference between improvement science and the TQM of the 80s. It's a very. This is very much influenced, for example, by by work on design thinking. So the the idea of kind of rapid small tests of change. I mean, very different from policy, where we're going to do something and then we're going to apply it to everybody, and then after we've done it, we're going to learn. Oh, gee, that really didn't work, and we put a lot of people through. Uh, through, experience, through some bad experiences that they really didn't need to have. So it, you need to understand this kind of work as being very different than what some of the stereotypes are, because that's exactly the conversation that existed in healthcare 20 years ago. 
Well, um, Ellen? Yeah, just, I mean, I find the conversation actually quite interesting. Because, um, just to put in a context, I'm chairing what's called a, a European Union expert group on science education, completely outside my field. Um, but what's interesting is that the issues that we talk about in higher ed are exactly the same issues in primary and secondary, and you would know, with, of, regarding the quality of teaching and the quality of teachers. We talk about quality here, you're talking about um, issues about in, improvement. But one of the kinds of things that is becoming increasingly important in the Irish context and also in the European is that we're spending a lot of time now looking at the whole educational experience and also looking at the, the whole educational learning continuum. And the, di and the picture that you had, Nancy, earlier, the diagram, I want to steal that, where everyone is blaming another part of the system, which is a major issue where you get to higher ed and you have these remedial issues. But one of the things, that, so we're looking a lot in the Irish context about conversations, these transitions, where higher ed is now discussing with secondary. What are the issues? What are the issues coming out of secondary school? What are the issues? Because it's not a question, all secondary, is, it's a transition to it. We've also got, developed a new national forum for teaching and learning. Everyone's involved, all, everyone from all the institutions about looking at all these issues. We've got teaching and learning certification as a requirement in many cases for, it's not a pre-requirement for appointment, but once you're in, certainly in my own institution, you have to have had this certification over the first two years. Uh, we've got, just in the past um, couple of weeks, there were Teaching Hero Awards. So there's an increasing emphasis on teaching and how you go about that and communities of practice and so on and how you might improve that. And I think they are part and parcel of the same issue. Um, and it's also about embedding that in how faculty are rewarded and awarded mm -hmm. in terms of promotion and uh, recruitment. And just a final thing I'd say is I'm closing the research teaching gap because it seems to me that even in the teacher training things, which you get in your secondary um, schools particularly, we know all these problems. So my question is, well, we know that. Why are we still having these problems? Right. So why do we, so how are the teachers being taught themselves? So but, but I guess what I want to pose to you, and again, this is not SUNY specific. We ran a poll today of faculty on online education. And the poll found that the overwhelming majority of faculty do not believe online courses come close to the quality of in-person courses. Mm -hmm. And our theories, and then we, we sliced and diced it. We thought, well, maybe it's older faculty who are dubious. But no, the younger faculty share their skepticism. Mm -hmm. And then we said, well, maybe it's just those who've never taught online. And then we found that those who taught online, while they think it's better than those who've never taught online, they think on average, better in person. And that, and, 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 but that's just like about one reform. I mean, I was at a meeting where Jamie Marisotis, the head of, of Lumina, got up and thought a bunch of faculty members were gonna thank him. And they were like an open revolt. Like, why are you imposing this on us? So what? even, and I guess thinking about these people who are leading their institutions, um, I think many in higher education who are deans and presidents and provosts aren't somehow selling it. And, and, and so I'm just curious why you think that is, that so many faculty are, in fact, deeply skeptical of the kinds of reforms that you're talking about, and what could change that? What are we all talking about? I mean. It's all very well to talk about online learning, and yes, that's part of a package of learning development, and we look increasingly at blended as opposed to mm -hmm. just blended. Yeah. But the point of the matter, there are other forms of change aside from that, so if that was used as an indicator of change, 
it's potentially an outlier. I mean, there are other kinds of mechanisms. But, but, but you can talk about many, you know, an emphasis on jobs as opposed to liberal arts is a hot button issue Absolutely. at many it's institutions. A huge, it's there, a huge. there are lots of issues that have nothing to do with technology. And just generally right now, I think there is a lot of skepticism, maybe not in SUNY, and SUNY right now has been treated uh, better economically than many of your fellow states, and so there's growth in a lot of things that faculty think are important here. But nationally, mm. there's just a lot of skepticism. Why do you think faculty are not embracing the choice that you offered? Well, I, I want to be clear. I'm not, I was, I'm not arguing for online courses. In fact, well, but reform, but, reform but generally. I do, but I do think the online course issue is a really good one because it forces the question about, I mean, and I believe as most faculty do, that there is something distinct about that in-person experience in a classroom. But mm -hmm. unless we can articulate what those qualities are, mm -hmm. and we can in some way demonstrate that we can get this to happen for most students most of the time, we're going to lose out to what we actually can measure. We can certainly measure the differences in the cost of these things. And, you know, the evidence on, on some of these have been the randomized control trials. And some of the randomized control trials say kids learn as much in the online courses as they, as they learn in regular classrooms. Uh, I, I mean, the evidence is kind of mixed in this area, especially the evidence is actually negative when you, when, for online courses when you're talking about very disadvantaged students. But, but the point is that it's really important to have this conversation about what quality is and how do we get it to happen yeah. regularly. Because to say it's better isn't actually going to convince the public audiences that we have to convince. Um, and now, that's, now, a that's, lot of what people think about is a traditional residential experience. So let me put you on the spot, Harvey. Do you think that it is preferable to be at Binghamton compared to taking online courses from your best faculty? Yeah. Well, uh, having taught online courses and, and knowing how difficult it is sometimes to be the teacher of an online course, uh, the cost of teaching is easy, is lower. The cost of learning may be higher yeah. because that one-to-one -one interaction now that I have to do through email or telephone calls, mm -hmm. I could have done in a larger setting more rapidly and, and my cost would have been lower to, to get the same amount of learning. So I think right now we're only measuring the cost of teaching, not the cost of learning, which is subtle. Um, but I think you can blend courses so well now. You, you can have your lectures sitting there on your laptop and they can be watching it on the bus on the way in. And when they get into class, they're not listening to the PowerPoint. They're actually talking to each other and they're discovering things and they're working out assignments mm -hmm. in class. So you can use technology really well to enhance the classroom experience. But I, and, and you can replace the classroom as well with an online experience. And sometimes that's beneficial for students who can't make it to the classroom. Um, but I think we have to readdress the cost question of learning in that model. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ellen, did you want to? Yeah, well, I, I would agree. But I think that the issue of how faculty are responding, there are changes. I mean, the public by and large, is asking more questions about value for money. We have had the University Association before what we would call the Public Accounts Committee of the Parliament asking, what are you doing all day? <laughs> and um, the response about, well, we're thinking or we're preparing isn't adequate. Um, so there are these kinds of questions. The big issue about not just what public um, higher education is good at, but what it's good for. And these become really major questions, particularly if I would say the European context where we're basically 80% publicly funded, okay, a bit less in some circumstances, but you go to Germany, it's 100%, you go to other countries. So these are really um, quite fundamental questions. And I think to that extent, there are questions being asked of all of higher education, the faculty come under particular pressure, um, and we're looking, the debate over employment versus employability are two different issues, and there is a huge tension and a gap between what, when I refer to our stakeholders, I mean our employers, our, our business, our enterprise, our civil society, 
what they think should be coming out and whether or not graduates should be what I would say are up and ready, or they've got these wider competences. Um, are we talking about skills or competences, as I say, or employment or employability? And increasingly, the emphasis is on employability and competences because we need to consider that the students living coming out today will be living to the end of the century. They're certainly beyond my lifetime. But <laughs> so with these sorts of agendas for change, I'm thinking about our lunch speaker. And, and I'll confess that as an editor, I'm a manager. And when I was hearing him talk about you, the, you, you want to encourage people to say, I intend. I couldn't help but think that if the reporter who right now is sifting through the gainful employment regulations sent me an email after this saying, I intend to file my story next Wednesday, I would send back a note saying, no, I intend for you to file it this afternoon. And, and, um, and so maybe that means I don't get his, the new model of leadership. But, but, um, <laughs> but, but some of what we were hearing today was about a more collegial mo model of leadership. And then other things that we're hearing today are about the imperative of change and evidence and scale. And I'm just wondering what you all think about how higher education negotiates and, that. And, and I think one thing we've, we've missed from this conversation too is the role of research, the yes. role of faculty scholarship, yeah. um, and that balance between scholarship and teaching. And where should that balance lie right now? I think that's the, a very difficult question because every university is of a different uh, design. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that it, it is particularly important for the accountability issues. Um, research sh should lead to discovery. Um, and so that if a faculty member's time is split between teaching and research, what is the discovery? What is the expectation? And how can we change those loads between teaching and research in a way that, that makes the university more optimally, um, optimally designed, but also within a structure of, a, of unionized faculty? makes it a little more difficult to change workload uh, structures over short periods of time. So um, I have been a poor moderator and not opening up for questions, and our time is limited. Um, are there any questions from the audience or comments about these issues? And if you could introduce yourself, if there are. Any hands? Anyone want to tell us what they intend to do when they get back to campus? <laughs> uh, is that? Somebody back there? Um, I guess you're questioned out, so let me ask, uh, ask another. Just as you think about what we've been talking about today, about how to promote change, I wonder if each of you might identify an unsolved problem at your institution or that your institution deals with and how you would apply some of these issues. Um, Ellen, as you look at Ireland. Well, I expect to say the biggest um, problem we face is this squeeze between um, greater demand, greater demand not just by students but of society, at a time of um, decreasing resources and at the same time of increasing quality in an international comparative sense. I think this is one of the issues that I think also that came out of, of the talk was this the importance of um, what I would say is benchmarking. This is the use of comparisons yeah. and the way in which we live increasingly in an internationally comparative environment in which the notion of what I would call self-declaration, at the other hand, is no longer sustainable. So I would, not just in the Irish sense, but in the governments and whatever, this notion that of, of, which has tended to be a faculty thing of, I'm great. Well, it's now, show me. And increasingly, this is the kind of thing you, we get with OECD, this notion about reference societies. But we see this constantly. So we live increasingly in this globalized world, and yet this crunch between funding, resources, public accountability. And if efficiency is the only driver, I think we're at a losing end. I think it has to be something that people can buy into more acceptably than just efficiency. Harvey? I think the question of employability is going to be critical. Uh, more than half the students still are graduating with degrees in social sciences and humanities across the country. Uh, they have certain great attributes 
But, and if you look at their, I think Inside Higher Education did a study, they have higher earning potential, but it's much further out in their mm -hmm. career. How can we help accelerate that? Uh, how can we get those experiences that they need uh, built into the curriculum? How can we get that to count towards the degree? Um, so some form of how we modify the first year after the gra after student graduates, I kind of call it the 411, four years of your undergraduate, one year of internships, and then one year of a master's. We, we have to think of this five or six year period to make our students in the social sciences and humanities really ready to be employable and, and not let them go home and, and wander for a year or so uh, at, in, their, in their old bedroom, uh, mm -hmm. wondering what they're going to do in a year or two, and their, and their parents are saying, go. Uh, Tony? Um, for better or worse, we live in a time where we value what we measure, uh, but we often can't measure what we value. And this, I think, is a fundamental dilemma for all educators. Absolutely. Part of why we've become so committed to this work on engaging faculty in the continuous improvement of teaching and learning is because at the heart of this is the question of articulating what are the qualities we're aiming for in our classrooms and in our work and becoming more explicit about this and yes, measuring it because if we don't, someone else will define what it is we're about. And that, I think, is the most troubling problem confronting education globally. Because mm. it's not, you know, it started here, absolutely. but it is, it's, absolutely, it's, yeah. it's occurring all across the world. And this is a place where educators must lead, but they have to lead in that public conversation. Mm. Well, and along those lines, uh, today, in fact, uh, the Obama administration is releasing gainful employment uh, regulations. And while they will affect only a minority of programs at some of your community colleges, um, many would say that the Obama administration ratings, which are probably a few weeks away, are in some ways reflecting the same pressure mm -hmm. on institutions. Uh, I would just close by saying that uh, SUNY institutions are great to watch because there is such diversity of SUNY institutions and the issues, and, and yet, whether we're talking about community colleges or research universities or everything in between, really some great, great people in this room and so many great people on your campuses. So it's an honor to be here, and as a journalist, it gives me great copy, but you get to solve all these problems, so I wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. That's good. Thank you.